louder. I was just going to say that I've named my laptop computer HAL 9000 uh, <laughs> pursuant to that line of thinking because it's like, I'm sorry, Kurt Shirelli. I can't allow you to log on to the computer right now. <laughs> yeah. Please come back later. <laughs> yeah. Please wait. I'm like, no, I paid thousands of dollars for you, you motherfucker. <laughs> anyway, so, so much for my rants. I can't do that, Kurt. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. Am I being naughty again? I'm sorry. Should I shut I up and just be no, a nice you're boy? fine, man. You're, you're totally I fine. I was raised to be a polite, nice, Christian, Midwestern boy. Oh, and look boy, how both did they, they turned out. <laughs> boy, did that go off the fucking rails, let me tell you. <laughs> And what's up, everybody, and welcome back to Hypodermic, the pod that sticks you deep. This is the pod boss, TJ Bowser, and joining me as always is the maestro of mayhem, Mr. Nick Benson. Hey, hey. So tonight's guest, guys, is uh, is an old friend of mine. He's not like 40 years old friend, but uh, we've both worked in the business for that long. And uh, I I really, really respect this guy. This guy is a phenomenal artist. And when I say artist, he is artist to the nth degree. Um, he has worked on things like Mortal Kombat, um, Ninja Zombie, which is fantastic, um, James and the Giant Peach, and Robot Chicken. And now he is a fine artist but my god this man is just so good at what he does mr kurt chiarelli thank you for having me on nick i really appreciate it and thank you for that kind intro absolutely kind of cr cracks me up a little bit but <laughs> well it shouldn't i think your art is amazing so uh that's why you're here to talk uh, it's a it's a work in progress every day you know, you compete with yourself, you know, and you try to improve things and you're constantly on the lookout for new and interesting ways to see things. So, you know, it's a work in progress. Um, it's not an arrival. It's a journey, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, so do me a favor. I, I want to talk a little bit about, um, what kind of, you know, what sent you down this path? What got you here? Um, I know that, uh, I know that you've you've probably been drawing since God knows, probably out of diapers the way that you draw. So um, I'd like to know more about that. Like what led you here? What inspired you? Those kinds of things. Well, to do so, you turn this podcast into a psychiatrist couch. That's for sure. <laughs> um, you really want to you really want to do this? I mean, I'm you know, <laughs> it's like it's like you're going down. You're going down the rabbit hole, buddy. Okay. Well, that's a different um, podcast. We have yeah. that too. <laughs> oh, good. Okay. <laughs> hey, it's kill two birds with one stone day here at the studio. <laughs> well, you are right, though. Uh, as soon as I could get my pudgy little grubby mitts on a crayon, I probably was drawing. Uh, but that got me into serious trouble with the school administrators and my parents. Um, it was that's just very hardcore. Familiar. Yeah, very hardcore Midwestern conservative family. Um, you know, it was difficult to be honest with you, but, uh, my kindergarten teacher hated me and, uh, she couldn't stand the fact, uh, that I was drawing dinosaurs and vampires and werewolves all the time. <laughs> so basically, uh, she reported me to my parents. My mom forbid me to draw and uh -huh. once many times across my life, at that household uh, oh, she boy. had forbidden me to draw and uh in one case she actually took away pencils from me but that's another story anyway um <laughs> my kindergarten teacher basically looked like a drag queen stunt double for j edgar hoover uh sent me to the school <laughs> psychiatrist's office because i was drawing dinosaurs and i have one of my earliest drawings which is amazing i wish i had it here it wasn't in storage but it was like an orange, you know, brontosaurus in the foreground with a big smile on his face. And of course, there was a tyrannosaurus in, way in the background, which was green with big, sharp teeth. And I look at this like it was this drawing was done by somebody else other than myself. Uh -huh. And looking at it and with my, my insight into human uh, nature, I look at that. I say, this was just normal stuff. And yeah. there's nothing threatening, nothing weird going on. But... In the mind of these school administrators, it was like, <laughs> ah, yes. You were the fucking the devil. Red, 
oh my god, I was a Soviet yeah. sleeper cell. I mean, the Brontosaurus <laughs> was red colored for fuck's sake. I mean, you know, I was it was a commie's penisaurus. Obviously, Is this boy a spy? <laughs> yes. He's gonna grow up to be a communist or a homosexual or something like that. I'm like, being, what's wrong with that? <laughs> there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, it's in essence, there is nothing wrong with the things that they had a major hair up their backsides. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, never, yeah, never in that situation with m- Middle America, upper. I wouldn't say upper anything uh, up, unless they're up their ass. But um, yeah, those. I think they're just projecting the their own issues on so-called me. Christians, uh, the folks yeah. that call themselves so-called Christians, that judge not lest ye be judged, but uh, they do it anyway. <laughs> That's right. That's right. They were projecting their own issues onto me. I really think that uh, sure. there's yeah, uh, and I was like, you know, I turned out heteronormal, uh, her to uh, heteronormative, if you will. Uh, definitely left wing, and certainly not, you know, a part of any established. So, right. so they got one out of three. <laughs> Bravo to them, right? But that's a threat. You can't think outside the box. You need to shut your mouth, jump through the hoops, and, you know, don't ask, you know, how high, you know, to jump. Just do it. Just yeah. do it. Yeah. Trust authority. You know, that yeah. doesn't work out very well, does it? We've seen examples of that throughout history. Look at the Nazi, uh, Nazi Germany 80, <laughs> 90 years ago. And, you know, we fought against those people. You think, hey, let's not turn out like them. But now that's the direction our country is headed in. <laughs> Hey, look, Nick, it's not too late to get fitted for a brown shirt and jack boots. We're heading into an exciting new chapter of American history. (laughs) And as long as you're really good at, you know, uh, drawing a painting, blonde haired area and use with blue, stunning blue eyes, you know, procreating as according to the Bible, you know, you should be doing okay, you know? (laughs) Or better yet, you don't even need any skill or any talent. Just get yourself. Some uh, download AI program. There you go. <laughs> and, yeah, there it is. <laughs> I knew Sorry, that I had to touch on that nerve. Okay. Because... I knew that would come up. I knew that would come up. We're kind of getting a little off track here. We're getting into yeah, politics. Right? Let's talk about your your voyage to this. It was a long, hard one. It wasn't easy. I mean, you know, the thing is, is that for my parents' education, okay, was a means towards a very specific end. That is money. Uh, and education was not supposed to be something that <laughs> was supposed to be a lifelong endeavor. And, and yeah, and it was just like, I mean, how many times did my parents get on my neck about reading college level uh, books and all this other stuff? I mean, hell, I had an episode, uh, you know, in first grade where the librarian wouldn't let me take out a book because it was above my reading level. I waited four years to get my hands on that book. It was in the case. None unmoved, collecting dust. It was just like, it wasn't treated as a doorway to a better world or open up a little boy's mind. It was just an object in a display cabinet. Books are to be loved. They're supposed to be read. You know, they're supposed to be, um, you know, people should have access to them. Absolutely. So, you know, at these. Yeah, it's ridiculous. And I'm still angry about it. I mean, that was that happened 50 years ago, and I'm still angry about it. And whenever I see examples of that same sort of horseshit going on around me as an adult, yeah, you know, I get kind of uppity about that. I say, <laughs> Let the kid take the book out. Hey, if they can dig it, if they can understand it, boy, we're talking, you know, that's a good thing. Yeah. But, you know, withholding that site type of stuff from people, you know, it's still going on, but in a much more sophisticated way uh, on the governmental and media level. You know, withholding information from people, which they should know, and because they can use that information to improve uh, their lives and, you know, push human progress forward. Uh, but getting back to your original question, so there was a lot of friction in my view. I mean, sure. um, I, you know, I remember the first sculpture I ever did was when I was, um, uh, when I was six years old. It was, uh, I pointed to do a Bust of Beethoven for some strange reason because I just got turned on to his music in music class at my grade school. I loved his music. The Fifth Symphony just hit me like a thunderbolt. Yeah. And so I did this 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 bust of Beethoven, which <laughs> I would probably be looking at, it, shaking my head, saying, "What a lump of shit that is." Um, <laughs> but anyway, I got my hands on some red permaplast brand clay, modern clay. And so I did this thing, and my dad, of course, was watching the ball game as usual, and uh, and I wanted his attention. He had no interest in me, 
Um, I had served my purpose. Um, I was just a proof of the fact that he was potent as a male. And after that was done, you know, no more contact was needed. But he was there watching the ball game, and I tried to get his attention and wanted his approval. And I showed it to him, and I said, it looked like George Washington. Now shut up and watch the two. So I tossed it in the closet, and that was the end of my sculpting career until I was in high school. Mm-hmm. But um, I took the sculpting. I mean, sculpting was a revelation to me. Yeah. You know, and what prompted that was the fact that I love, you know, stop motion animation, Ray Harry Housen. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Films. Oh, God. Big inspiration to me, too. You know, that, and I, I'm one of those that can't, I can't do what you do. I can't work in two dimensions and make it, and make it magic. I cannot do that for the life of me. I am a three dimensional person. I can really only get my ideas out in, in, in that sculpture space because I'm in three dimensions there. Well, the funny thing about that is, is that I, I, I learned to express myself in two dimensions, which, but you are correct in saying that two dimen- trying to create the illusion of three dimensions in a two-dimensional format. Oh, God, yes. Much harder. Re- yeah, and try doing that when you're just a uh, developing mind, you're like five years old. And of course, that's going to be a popular struggle. But three dimensions, my God, that's just like rolling off a lot. That's just the juicy stuff. And sculpting plasticine, you know, is a very sensual experience. It's just yeah. so natural. You just fall in love with it immediately. Um, so yeah, I, I dig it. I understand completely. Um, and you know, there's you know, there's nothing you shouldn't you shouldn't beat yourself up about that because it's just we, we're three dimensional beings. We yeah. see our world dimensionally. Now, what's really interesting is I'm absolutely fascinated by two dimensional graphic design. People who work in very flat shapes. And they can, you know, send a message, very potent message, very quickly, very economically. I'm fascinated by that. Um, it's, you know, kind of the kind of, uh, polemic opposite of what we do with monster sculptures and things like that. Yeah. Where we, uh, we kind of pack it with detail and intricacy. We try to make it, you know, that moist clay. So as you as you were saying, you were in high school. You put everything away pretty much until high school because you weren't getting the what you needed. uh, You know, um, well for sculpture, I mean, I was still drawing on and off. And um, I, I tell you, but one of the big epiphanies of my life was delivered uh, courtesy of my seventh grade art instructor Jerry Tibstra, who I'm friends with now on Facebook, which is marvelous. I mean. I, I just love that sense of continuity. You know, I really invest in long-term relationships. Unfortunately, yeah. that sort of mentality, you know, that really is contrary to the way people in America live their lives now. Mm-hmm. But getting back to the point, Jerry Tipstra, uh, after we came back from Christmas break in uh, 1980, I think it was, or 79, um, he had a student wall with pages from the uh, 1976 to 1978 J.R.R. Tolkien calendars that you remember those. Yeah. Uh, they were illustrated by the brothers Hildebrand. Oh, wow. And it's like, you could smell the ozone as, you know, uh, you know, the electricity was arcing across neural synapses in my brain. I probably had <laughs> little puffs of clouds coming out of my ears. I was like, wow, I found it. I yeah. finally this is this is what my life is going to be dedicated to, one way or the other. To this very day, I mean, Jerry's probably sick and tired of hearing it, you know. I've said it a couple of times. But uh, the deep sense of gratitude. See, that's the thing about real teachers, the good ones. See, they always dream of spark igniting that, uh, that mental acreage in a child's head, you know. They're the torchbearers. And Jerry did that. Yeah, you know, he succeeded. Well, you know, depending on what your concept is success. I mean, by the American standard, it's just like, you're just an artist loser. You know, you don't count. Right. Well, I, I think by and large, like all, all an artist really needs to hear, whether it's from another artist or a parent or even an art teacher, especially an art teacher really is, is that they believe in them and they believe that they have something because once given that, once given that, I think that that's kind of where you let yourself go a little more and, and let yourself do more. Yes. He, he basically handed me the keys. Of course, he, he, he had the keys on offer to anybody in that classroom. But I was the one who just like snatched those things out of his hand and said, dude, thank you so much. I'm off to the races. You know? 
Um, the rest of them were just like, yeah, I'm just here just to talk around with this time. And I think there was no contact made to the best of my knowledge. I mean, had some of my classmates actually done something with their talent, right. I would have known about it and I would have been in contact with them and said, hey, let's go out for beers or something if you're in the neighborhood. Uh, a lot of them, you know, they did not do that for one reason or another. And that's their decision. And I fully respect that. There's no judgment made on that. We all have to follow our own path. But, you know, it's like when you have people who come up to you, you know, and they, they judge me and say, when are you going to get your life together? When are you going to become right. a part of America? America <laughs> right. I'm like, fucker. I yeah. pay hundreds of millions of dollars for corporate America, so go fuck yourself. <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. That was an improper attitude. I'm, I'm, I'm losing track of my Midwest. That's, that's okay. Raised. That's okay. You know what? My takeaway from, from a lot of your background is, is just that it's very similar with, with my, like to myself and other mm-hmm. artists that I, that other true artists that I do know very well. And I think that you know very well that a lot of us come from, whether it be broken homes or people didn't believe in us or, or whatever. Um, and that kind of fueled us to go off into that kind of isolation where that was our, like that was our safe space. You know, that was drawing or whether it was drawing or sculpting or whatever, that, that was our safe space. That was where we had fun and we just kind of felt like outcasts. But when we were doing that, that that was how we, where we felt the most comfortable. And, yes. uh, and, That's right. you know, so, so for me, it's, it's, it's a very familiar story. Um, but tell me a little bit about what, what got you to, uh, what did you do? Did you, I can't, I can't remember. Did you do Mortal Kombat first or did you do Ninja Zombie first? Um, actually, I did Ninja Zombie, but first okay. of all, what, what got you? A little, little sidetrack there. Why would you bring up that horrible direct to <laughs> horror feature? Is this like some sort of. Look, if you were a this real is just, journalist, hey, this, you, is, this, this would have been in your gotcha. Uh, this podcast is called the Hypodermic. We go deep, brother. <laughs> that and I think no, 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 Agfa no, no. and Bleeding Skull actually uh, restored that film and is giving it attention. So nice. Yeah. <laughs> that was a zero budget. I only had enough money for the master of the title of the character, <laughs> Ninja Zombie. And I got to say, that was a nightmare. I mean, I could go on, but I'll tell you, uh, after watching one of our stunt people um, pursuing to another line of inquiry into another person in this industry who we happen to know, who nearly killed one of his stunt coordinators, <laughs> in that case, Johnny, but in the case of Ninja Zombie, he nearly burned to death in front of me, Jesus. no more than 10 feet away from me. Jesus. And nobody gave a shit. Nobody, and it just told me, he said, I'm surrounded by sociopaths. What? I mean, they're utterly callous. Why, why, do I see, why do I see a set where the director's like, did we get the shot? Okay, put him out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like, oh, you with the rifle, uh, we don't want any witnesses. Could you please, please, please kill these people? Here? Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm getting it. By the way, I'm just warning you. I am getting a notification for some reason that my battery is low on my headphones. Yeah, when I haven't fully charged the last 48 hours. So just to warn you, um, that's operating in the background. Okay. So so post ninja. In case we get cut off. Literally you literally went from ninja zombie to Mortal Kombat then, didn't you? Uh the, well for, there were a few jobs models? in between there. Yeah, okay. there were a few jobs in between there. I okay. worked on a I believe this a stop motion uh, model for a trick uh serial commercial oh. for Calabash animation in Chicago. Very cool. And, uh, and of course, then I went over. Yeah, the story about that, um, about the making of Mortal Kombat and its background has been covered in other interviews uh, before. I don't know if you want to go into that. But yeah, there was uh, Ninja Zombie. There was also Rick Razor, which was from the same director, um, who is a sociopath. And I'm glad I no longer work with him or have any associations <laughs> with him. Yeah, we um, it was just a complete debacle from beginning to end with uh, right. Rip Razor and uh, Ninja Zombie, and I am shocked that this has actually been brought to my attention after thirty some odd years. It's <laughs> kind of weird, but I did the work, and it was a step in the right direction, skill wise. Ran foam latex, did all these things. So, yeah, all part of your journey, man. Yeah, you know, I look at it that way, although. Not something I would brag about. You learn what to do and what not to do. <laughs> yeah, 
And one of the big no-nos was working for Mark Bessinger again. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I don't like to chew my cut twice, as they say in the <laughs> Well, and you still, you didn't stop doing makeup effects either. You, you, not only were you making models and doing miniatures and stuff, but you, you still kept doing uh, makeup effects stuff. What, what about, tell me a little bit about drag. Oh, drag happens with another uh, associate of Mark Bessinger. Um, huh. That was um, just a bunch of zombie makeups. And I didn't huh. know what they were. I mean, he had two years of pre production on this film where I was not including into that. And I kept on begging and saying, Mark, you're going to do this thing. Let me prepare. It'll yeah. Cut back on your costs. It'll cut back on my heartache. And everything will be better. And it was a mess. Right. Um, I was constantly, I mean, they would, the producers would come in, you know, all frenzied and upset and agitated, saying, how many, you need to make out some more zombies. I'm like, <laughs> okay, how many? I don't know, just do it. Just fucking do it. And I'm like, um, at that point, I was already a professional um, artist. I've been making my way since 1986. You know, I was in my sophomore year of college. I was already getting gigs. Right. And these films were like amateur grade, mostly. Right. And uh, so anyway, so there's no preparation, no courtesy, no professionalism whatsoever. So with uh, regards to indie film, not a lot has changed. <laughs> You know, I, it's actually yes, funny. That's precisely it. I pulled out my book here, <laughs> uh, the Bleeding Skull book, and there's actually an uh -huh. entry in here about Ninja Zombie. My God, how, how did it's like a trail of toilet paper on my heel after going <laughs> to a gas station? <laughs> uh, can I ask you? You is don't there... like take a selfie of yourself at you know, a, a, a Union seventy six station, right? It's like <laughs> I was here. You know, it's just like yeah, we all know what it smells like. We all know what's on the floor. <laughs> you take a hot shower afterwards and just wipe the grime off of yourself. It says uh, the movie Korean features an extreme cl close up of a play school medieval playset, and it also features a gay remake of Night of the Living Dead. Yeah, that pretty much wraps it up. <laughs> uh, you know, th thematically, I can't relate to that plot, guys, okay? But, so know, that's, so that's the pinnacle of the film, then. <laughs> Pretty much. Uh, I'm not a gore guy. If somebody else is, that's cool. Uh, the, the For me, the only thing I could hang my hat on was the fact that I could design and sculpt and build a creature. Yeah. yeah. And that was a titular character. And that, for me, was the takeaway. And it keeps on trailing and keeps on spinning back and hitting me in the backside, um, right. which is interesting. But, hey, you know, <laughs> we all have our origin stories. You know, it's like that Beethoven bus. Okay. <laughs> It's not it's not the best, but it got me where I'm going today. You know? That's right. So, That's right. Philosophical part. <laughs> So, okay, let's fast forward a little bit and talk about uh, how did you wind up getting on James and the Giant Peach? Well, I'm a big stop motion guy. And yeah. I've done the rounds uh, in Chicago, which used to be a fairly sizable commercial um, television um, deal. We right. had a lot of agencies in Chicago back in the 1980s before Reagan shit came the economy. Right. And uh, and even special effects companies, but they're all fo folding by the time I was getting out into the job market and force. And one guy named uh, Paul Jessel, who, anyway, Paul had just mentioned as a side that they were gearing up for this project. And I yeah. finally got the phone number and I talked to Paul Jessel, who was the production designer, and he forwarded me to a few departments and I did the rounds. And uh, I ended up in the uh, fabrication department because uh, nobody wanted to work with Benita and Carlo anymore. Uh, I'm talking about another sociopath. Yeah. <laughs> this one, this one was. Well, I don't know, you I just don't like but anybody, do you? <laughs> I like select people. I'm a very yeah. selective person. No, I know that. You know, I, I, I know how you are. I've known you long enough to know who you like and who you don't. <laughs> yeah, it's like if I can, if you, if there's respect and trust. That's the foundation of everything else. Absolutely. And if that isn't there, then forget it. It's yeah. not going to work. It's just going to snap you in the hands. Absolutely. Um, but in that case, there was no trust because yeah. there was no respect. And yeah. the people who had worked with her on Nightmare Before Christmas refused to come back to work for her on James ah. and John Peach. Yeah, she was geared up for her department, which created a problem for her. So she got me in. But... Uh, after I got my interview, she was snarky. She was extraordinarily 
arrogant and rude towards me, even during the uh, interview process. Right. And uh, the first day I came, came to work, you know, I came in with my tools and everything. She just screamed at me, go back to Chicago. Oh, wow. And I'm like, you've got a nicer uh, tool chest than I do. She's like, <laughs> one to through it. And I was like, hey, is this community chest? This, this yeah. is, these are my tools. Don't go rummaging through. Just open up the drawers and everything, rummaging through there. You've got a, you've got a better chest than I do. She had a fishing tackle box. And you uh -huh. know what? Who cares? This isn't about status, okay? This isn't yeah. me, you know, trying to prove anything. I came yeah. in prepared because, man, I was ready to go. I was enthusiastic. Yeah. I love staff motion. I'm very proud of some of the small, innovative uh, techniques that I've brought to the, the, the table. And, oh, absolutely. Uh, although I was, I was treated. Like tell me, tell me a little bit about those. Tell me a little bit about those. What, what did you, what did you bring to the, to the? And I mean, I, it, it just lists you as a character fabricator, but I know you're far more than that. So I'm sure you brought some ideas to the table. I'd like to, like to hear about that. Well, I worked on what we had a division within the fabrication of hard parts and soft parts. Um, uh -huh. And sometimes I did, I worked mostly the character I was most responsible for was the fabrication, painting, and uh, uh, duties regarding the earthwork. He's my favorite character because he's kind of soft. And uh, all the others, though, I worked on various parts, sometimes even the hard part for them. I'll give you an example. Um, the lady book was, you know, was a replacement head. It was cast in your thing, hard yeah. and thin doesn't. And there was like this very gentle, you know, swirl to her hair, highlights it. Yeah. What I did is I went down uh, to the uh, another department. I believe it was the, um, the scenic department. We had a vacuum form machine, and uh -huh. I vacuum formed her head, and then carefully cut out with a dribble tool the areas which could be airbrushed. In other words, oh, you know, nice. you're, you're con yeah, you're controlling, you're yeah. making sure that it's uniform from shot to shot. Yeah. And so, um, so I brought that to there, and I was trying to imitate the illustrations that uh, we were basing it on. I think I did that quite well. Uh, there's also some other things that I brought to bear. Uh, I organized and uh, set up and cleaned two full airbrush shoes. Um, if, you, if you want to know just how piggish women can be, they're every bit as piggish as men. So, you know, yeah. the whole thing. The entire department uh, had only two men in it, and we were constantly being given a hard time. Really? Um, you know, oh, yes. Oh, yes. It's a cutting edge, uh, Miss Andrews type of environment. You know, wow. I've been in a lot of studios, and women are treated very poorly. Uh, but you know what? This was kind of like payback time. And the irony is, is that I've always treated my colleagues with total respect, and they're where they come from. Right. So there is that, uh, which made my life very hard and very stressful. Yeah. And it doesn't have to be that way. This is my yeah. kind of angle on the whole thing. It doesn't have to be this way. Also, somebody is paying you a good living wage <laughs> to do your art. Show yeah. a little gratitude. Show a little yeah. respect. But hey, I'm sorry to talk like a nutcase again, so you better stop it. Because um, <laughs> yeah. people in this business are, just look at me like I'm from Mars. Like, dude, what the fuck? No, Are you, you know, this, shit this is my no, is, This is I get that. Get even with the world, you know. No, the thing is, you speak your mind, and you're not afraid to speak your mind, which is pretty, pretty fucking admirable. So, you know, I mean, that's I've been ousted from a lot of things because of my mouth. So, <laughs> so I, God I know, bless you. <laughs> I know the I I know the drill. <laughs> Good for you. Hey, if one of us stood up and said these things. You know, you wouldn't be like you know, this bigger target. People, yeah. before they waded into you, they would stop and say, oh, shit, we've got 10 of them here in the department. Maybe sure. we should just back off and, you know, take heed and maybe fix a few things here and there, whatever we can. But boy, you sure you weren't ever a punk rocker? <laughs> he has a lot of those views, huh? You know what? I've been listening. To I've been listening. <laughs> Could you imagine me with a pretty punk rock players? attitude? Well, you know what? The thing is, is that the punk rockers, when I knew them uh, in uh, college, you know, they looked down their nose at me. It was a clean cut guy with a, a part of hair and everything. I was wore these collared shirts, Oxfords, you know, and uh, they kind of looked down at me and said, Oh, God, a Republican. You know, you yeah. probably go to church every Sunday and you probably <laughs> think black people are sick. And I'm like, Dude, I'm 
back then. Man, you don't know me at all. Okay. Yeah. Um, it's not like I, it's just the way I, it, the, the marbles roll downhill for me. You yeah. know, uh, I've always loved movie soundtrack music, which led me to classical. That's, that's my, that's my, you know, uh, ambrosia. Oh, that's you know, great that's stuff. stuff. It's some you know, of the genius the stuff ever made. Oh, absolutely. And you know, when I worked in the studios, they would be cranking up uh, heavy metal music. I totally get that music. I understand yeah. it. It's romantic. Yeah. It's wild. It's passionate. It's a stuff of the human soul. It has its own poetry. It's not my thing. Yeah. My, my, you know, my aesthetic sensibility is otherwise, but I get it. And you know yeah. what? Uh, but this new crap that's coming up. And maybe here's where the old partisan thing starts to happen in my own personality. But I listen to this. Oh, oh, I just, I, I can't go on because I'm just going to get. Well, that's, you know what? That's the thing, though. I, I, I have to, like, I listen to everything. I listen to punk. I listen to metal. But, like, I can go from that and I can flip on, like, a John Williams or a, or a fucking Hans Zimmer soundtrack and just get mm-hmm. so sucked into it. Yeah, it's, it's so hard. easy it's to get sucked hard. into it. Man. It's so good. The problem with a lot of this stuff is, first of all, you know, this is cool. I'm talking when I'm talking about pop music today, I'm talking about the corporate guys direct they force oh, yeah. upon. Mm-hmm. And it has no feeling, it has <laughs> no perspective. Even yeah. if I don't Yeah, it is soulless. That is exactly the right word I'm searching for. It's it's, it's sellable. Dead. That's all they give a shit about, right? That oh we can yeah, we can well, sell this 16 to the masses. Sixteen writers, seven yeah. producers. Yeah. <laughs> It's called a meal ticket, boys. That's yeah. exactly what it is. <laughs> Forget about the artist. It's just like, hey, what am I going to be doing? You know, when I want to go on vacation? Uh, yeah. yeah. How can we package and sell it? That's all they really mm-hmm. give a shit about anymore. Yeah. And, and, and right. music business, we've we've touched on that on this show, even with uh, with some of our musical guests. Um, the music business is absolutely crazy. Streaming is uh, killing. And it's terrible things. to its artists. It's terrible to its artists. I've got um, a friend who's entering into the music industry right now, and he's uh, trying to produce the eight CD box set. And he approached me uh, to do the cover artwork and some of the graphic designs and the logo for his company. And, you know, the struggle was like saying, wow, that's and I had several very long uh, term conversations with him regarding this project. Of his. And, you know, I said, look, you know, I'm not trying to complicate things, but you need to know what you're walking into and what needs to be done to make this happen. He was a bit overwhelmed, but I do hope that his project, with or without me, comes to fruition because that's, I mean, that sort of enter- sense of enterprise, believing yeah. in an artist and trying to get the word out there and, you know, make a little profit so you can put it back into the next project instead of into your, you know, your bonus, uh, Christmas bonus or stock yeah. options. I mean, so you, you artificially you, increase your stock value. You would hope these entities would be better to their artists, but they never are. Mm-mm. No. It's gotten worse. It's they about exploiting more. them. I mean, it's no different than what we experience. You know, it's about them exploiting us for what we do, and and then yeah. it's you know, and then it's like then on, we're on to the next thing because we're trying to fucking eat. Yeah, that's right. Uh, it's gotten worse. I mean, look at what happened with Taylor Swift and Ticketmaster. Oh, absolutely. It's just, it just doesn't fucking end, gentlemen. Um, right. And it's gotten worse, and they keep on you know they keep on strangling that golden goose. And they, they would, if they heard our, our attitudes, they'd probably laugh at us and say, I don't know, I'm doing pretty good. I'm buying my fifth vacation home. Thanks for you, assholes. <laughs> and I say, yeah, you're doing well, but the rest of the country isn't, and certainly not its artists. And man, without us, we don't have a civilization. Sorry. I, maybe that sounds pompous and arrogant, but you don't have a civilization. Right. And you might as well pack it in. Hey, how many people can tell you the names of ancient Greek or Roman lawyer? Oh. God, okay. yeah. <laughs> no one. But you can mention right. some of its artists and writers, can't you? Okay, right. yeah, you got some politicians and journals in there who killed a lot of people. You know, they got the <laughs> tributes, the public tributes, right? Yeah, sure, but they're murderous psychopaths. We've got plenty of those out there, or we will. Yeah. But now, when you think of ancient Rome, think of those white uh, marble columns, those blue columns, glistening in a Roman uh, sunset. You think about the statues. And the yeah. gold jewelry and yeah. all the other finery. You see, you know, <laughs> that's not peripheral. That's central to who we yeah. are as, as a species. And you know yeah. what? They don't get it. They'll never get it because they're psychopaths. The psychopaths have no aesthetic sensibility whatsoever. They cannot yeah. create, they can only explore. <laughs> 
This Rant is all over. too true. <laughs> all too true. So um, I have I have a burning question just because I, I know you personally and I I kind of think that I see what I think I see in this in this next question. I'm curious about your time on Robot Chicken because I know you did some some sculpting for them. Um, I I love I love the designs of those things, man. They're just they're cool as hell. And I'm just curious if any of it is, uh, you know, designed by you. Uh, no, my uh, I did I, I did some um, some um, likenesses. In fact, uh-huh. I recall, uh, it's kind of a blur back then. I was very busy at the time, but I did a sculpture of uh, Scrubbing with Hanson mm. for them. They were going to use that. Because uh, they couldn't find, they couldn't source, you know, one of their action figures with their likeness. So, uh, uh, yeah, that was before she was. And Seth Green, uh, he, says, you know, he says, so Kurt, how attached to money are you? <laughs> right. Smiled on the inside. Thinking, Barry, baby. Because you know what? In that town, if you're not making more money than the last part of your work on, you're dead. You know, your career is pretty much gone. Because one will get around and say, yeah, we can screw that ass. Oh, yeah, of and course. And they do. And they do so it. That's a theory. And that was pretty much um, the only thing I did for them. Gotcha. Um, yeah. So it wasn't very much, but the episode turned. I mean, I found out about this like five years after the fact or something. Uh, the episode was nominated for Emmy. And then all of a sudden, I, this is how I found out about it, is that one day this big cardboard box from my alma mater, Columbia College, Chicago, arrived at my doorstep. Uh-huh. I said, what the hell is this? must be a mistake. It's the rest of my name. They even spelled my name correctly. I was impressed by it. Then I pop open the box, and there's all this Columbia College branded swag inside, you know, duffel bags and keychains and other such things. And the letter from the pre- then president of the college saying, congratulations, you being uh, you know, an alumni and getting an, uh, an Emmy nominated it's a great honor for the college. Here's some gifts for you. Thank you so much for being a student, you know, doing honor <laughs> to our institution, et cetera, et cetera. I was like, really? Okay. Yeah. It, <laughs> they, just, they just wanted to swing your name in front of more potential students. That's all. Of course. It was all PRs. And I still have the box filled with stuff. Never used it. Got my own keychain. Thanks, boys. Yeah. Uh, anyway, the thing is, is that I was like, okay. And then, of course, you know, I was uh, looking around for an institution to uh, give my estate to, my uh, book manuscripts, the artwork, sculpture, castings, molds, etc. And uh, Columbia College was one of them. And I contacted them saying, you know, uh, I have no next of kin, and if I should die, I want to will this stuff to you guys. Would you accept it? And they said, absolutely not. You're not important enough. Uh, you're not <laughs> well known enough for us to take on that issue because our county department says it would be too much, too much money out of pocket. Wow. So I was like saying, yeah, I'm, I'm a valued woman. I'm, yeah, I'm feeling that. Wow. That, that that's yeah, that's a great response. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's it's wonderful. It's just like. <laughs> How, why should I ever feel? Well, I mean, it's an arts culture, for Christ's sake. I'm right. an artist, okay? Right. So I've done a few things. I would have done more if, had, if I had the chance, if I had the opportunity. But, you know, what well, I they might as well. They might as well have said, well, your name's not Tim Burton, so nah. <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah you're not associated on. with Steven Spielberg. You have no right. value to us. No PR value. <laughs> and, you know, the, the fact of the matter is, um, there are some people, very few people, who I've ever invited over to my home. Yeah. And the few people who have seen what I've got here, you know, they're just like their eyes are bugging out of their sockets. I said, why aren't you posting this stuff online? I said, yeah. because AI search engines are trawling the internet yeah, looking no. for free shit. No, no, I'm one I'm of those people. I'm accident. one of those people that's seen your work, man, and it's it's so freaking amazing. And um, oh, thank you. I I don't know, like that that's perfect because I want to lead into talking about that, like your current works, and you know, like whether it's your your drawings or your you know any paintings or any sculptures you have. Like I've seen some of that, I've been privy to it, and you've been nice enough to share it with me. It is absolutely stunning work, and and what what inspires you for that? I mean, is it all of that, all of that stuff in the past, all of the Lovecraft, all of the, all of the Ray Harryhausen, all of is all of that 
kind that of a is, culmination. That is a living that. thing. That is, that is a living, breathing organism that lives inside my soul. Right. You know, I'm constantly trying to, you know, replenish that. As you know, I'm political. And right. just looking at this, what's going on in American society, the state of the union, you know, it crushes my soul <laughs> with despair. But, you know, the, the fountain, which I always go back to, right. are the basics. And, you know, um, yeah, my origins. Go back to that. That's where I get my nutrition. Yeah. And it revives myself. It's funny the way my mind works. It's bizarre. You know, when I get briefed on a project, I'll, I'll bet into either the word or the way the word was intoned, and that will just be the springboard that I'll use, you know, to right. develop my ideas. Somebody will say something which just just did it, what does it for me. And I'm off and running. Uh, insofar as myself and being self regenerative, it's uh, a little bit more involved uh, right. because, you know, it, you need stimulation from the outside environment mm -hmm. to be really good at art. And right. so I'm constantly, you know, reading stuff, listening to stuff, talking to people. And so that's, you know, that's how I do it, I guess. Um, insofar as my, I've got three major projects going on simultaneously. I got the Lovecraft Gallery exhibit project, which I'm working on. Most oh, artists, okay. what they'll do is they'll talk the gallery into hosting the show and then go into a frenzy trying to produce the artwork <laughs> after they secure the time. I'm like, no, dude, you know, it's going to be 15 to 25 pieces. Drawings, sculptures, and paintings. Yeah. And uh, you've seen some of the drawings, which are the oh, yeah. part of that. They're that's amazing. just the sketches. Um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, and they're original designs, but here's the scary part. I have two full filing cabinets full of character design sketches, environments, and to the best of my knowledge, these are completely, absolutely original. Okay? Yeah. They're not riffing off of somebody else's, you know, top notes here, okay? These are mine. And yeah. everybody's just like, who sees them, and they're just like, dude, why the fuck are you keeping this secret? Secret. You're going to take it to the <laughs> fucking grave. What good is it then? I yeah. said, well, well, no, you don't get it, okay? I don't need a lot of people, you know, applauding me every time I take a car, okay? We have certain people in our you know, society who are addicted to that. That's not my addiction, okay? Yeah. My addiction is the process. And so yeah. I'm doing it for me. I'm not doing it yeah. for anybody else. But the, here's the thing, too, is that I resent being exploited because I've been, been exploited my entire life. Sure. One way or the other. And I get fed up with it. And I really get angry at colleagues who are just like, you know, acrobatic by that. You know, dude, it just is what it is. It sucks, but what are you going to do? Well, <laughs> there's a lot you can do. You can just tell them to fuck themselves and <laughs> respect your respect yourself and your art a little bit more. Yeah. And, you know, prevent them from doing these things to you. My God, yeah. what are you? Are you a man or an amoeba? Yeah. So, um, yeah, sorry being very... No, no, that's okay. That's all part of who you are. I, I'm, I'd like to like, I wish I could share like, because this is an audio only episode, I can't share any of these drawings, nor would you necessarily want me to, but, but how can like, I, I by, by our conversation, I'm guessing that, that really the only way to see your work is to like, see these shows, uh, when they can, hang, I ask a question about his work or, in Halo real quick. Absolutely. Sure. Go for it. Did you design like sculpt Cortana and then they use that as a reference for the games? No. Uh, well, that's a little story right there. Um, they didn't want me. Uh, I was recommended by a guy who worked on that, who later became the project manager and attempted to extort a kickback for me to keep my job as a freelance sculptor on Halo Action Figure. Uh -huh. That's a thorny issue right there, but I'll tell you. Oh, yes. Um, there's some real dark uh, sculpt delivery going on there, guys. But to answer your question, uh, they wouldn't even send me any type of uh, reference material. They what? told me to go buy the game and, uh. and figure it out. Wow. Um, yeah. And so what I had to do is I had an invent inventor from complete whole cloth. That is a complete and utter fabrication. I had no model. I had no indication. That's impressive. She had a short pixie haircut. She was, you know, thank you. And here's an odd thing. Some girl in Tennessee years later said, you know, I'm a spitting image of Cortana. Now I was thinking, <laughs> hey, is this like a groupie hitting on me? This is yeah. kind of good. I mean, I, I think that's <laughs> But how old are you? Yeah, oh, you're 17. Forget it. Goodbye. Yeah. <laughs> Out of here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, Cortana is a complete invention on my part. Um, and here's the thing. Years afterwards, they finally published the book, The Art of Halo. 
And here's all this incredible uh, uh, plethora of, you know, uh, reference material which they withheld from me. Yeah. Because right. essentially, they want failure. They did that. Yeah. I think Chicago Wang, one of the uh, artists who worked on the game, actually, uh, not the action figure, but the video game, you know, he sent me an email years ago saying, I wish I had your tell I was like, ah, a clue, Watson. There we go. <laughs> Yeah, so as we wind down here, uh, you actually do post some of your art on like deviant art and stuff. Uh, is it okay if I share the, yeah. uh, share with the people what your, uh, deviant art is? Oh, sure. It's, uh, deviantart.com uh, slash, algorithms. I used to... oh, oh wait, I'm sorry. deviantart.com slash davinci41 is where you can find Kurt in some of his art. Uh, AI sucks, so do not support it. Uh, <laughs> But he, he <laughs> posts you. some spicy memes and some really cool work there. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. The, uh, the other two projects um, that I'm working on simultaneously is a project where I satirize um, current situations and events yes. using American advertising uh, video and uh, artwork. So I'm doing the, the entire sh- shebang. The copywriting, the illustrations, and you know, the graphic design. So that's a lot of fun. And also, I'm editing a new book of arts essays. Awesome. Um, awesome. So that's in the process right now, trying to get that published. Awesome. Well, well, thanks for being with us today. We really do appreciate it. And uh, I, I definitely wanted to have you here because I think, I think the world needs to understand more about artists like you, mm-hmm. as well as understand our perspectives on things like AI and uh, those kinds of art. Uh, I don't necessarily think of them as art. I believe, you know, I believe that they steal algorithms, they create yes. algorithms from what we make and uh, basically steal our art. Um, so it's that being said, progression, isn't it? yeah, so that, <laughs> yeah, well, it's happened all our lives, hasn't it? But, uh, yes, it that being said, thanks. Thanks again for being with us. And, uh, thank you, TJ, for being here with me and absolutely pulling, pulling us through this and, um, we will see you next time. from this fucking podcast that's the issue at hand <laughs> i don't even vote democratic i vote independent fuck you no, I'm sorry, sorry, sorry. i've had too much coffee